Well, good morning and happy Palm Sunday and start of Holy Week to you. Um, this week will we'll look a little bit different than um, most weeks do in our church calendar. And so I'm going to walk you through just uh, what this week will look like for us here at a church. And I uh, would love to have you join in to any and all of the, these things we have going on. The first thing is that um, this Wednesday we will not have our typical Beyond Sunday event. So no dinner Wednesday night, um, but we're going to make it up to you with um, Monday, Thursday is at 7 o'clock in the social hall. So we have a Monday, Thursday service here in this room at 7 o'clock in the social hall. On Good Friday, our cantata will be at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, which is right across through those doors over there. Thank you for waving your palm, Everett. Uh, <laughs> the, and then Easter morning. Let me talk to you about what Easter morning will look like. So 6.30 a.m. will be our sunrise service, and that'll be in the prayer garden, uh, which is right outside of this door, and you see that beautiful garden area out there. That'll be followed by a breakfast in the table. The table is our, like, Starbucks kind of room down on our children's wing, and so I invite you to Come out for that. And then here are the other service times for Easter morning. We have our 8.30 a.m. traditional service, our 9.30 a.m. contemporary service, so just like where you are right now. Um, and then at 10.40, for those who have children, we will have our Easter egg hunt. And those will be divided by age. And so those will either be in our prayer garden or on our playgrounds. Um, that's our Easter egg hunt at 10.40 a.m. And then lastly is our 11 a.m. traditional service, which will be in the sanctuary. And so hope you join us throughout Holy Week. Hope you join us Easter morning. Um, we're looking forward to all God has in store for our church. <laughs> awesome, Mike. Why don't you stand up this morning and say good hello to your, your neighbor. We're glad you're here. our service today. I have the privilege of reading to you from Mark chapter 11 verses 1 through 11 which says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and, ju and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back to here shortly. Verse 4, they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied it to a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Could not hold him down. He 
joining us this morning. Won't you sing this now? The same power that rolled the stone away. The same power will live in us today. King Jesus, we call.
Lord. Thank you for palm branches. Hallelujah. Uh, we'd like to invite our children down to come join me. If you are new here today, let me explain a little bit of the rhythm of, of how we work. Um, we invite your, your child to participate and join us for a children's Sunday school here. Um, and uh, if they do participate, you will pick them up after service ends in our children's wing. You can just kind of follow the mass of parents headed that way. Um, and uh, yeah. So would you join with me as we pray for our children and bless them this morning? Lord, I thank you for the joy of these palm branches and the joy of these children. Lord, as you came into Holy Week this week, Lord, I pray that you would come into the lives of our children. We give you thanks for the ways in which you already are at work in their lives. We give you thanks for these parents, Lord. Pray that this week would be impactful and meaningful for them in their journey of faith. Lord, we love you, and it's for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. As we shouted Hosanna, let us remember that we are never alone. There's always someone with us. There's always someone with us in the fire. Won't you sing with us? There's a grace when our heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be. Another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire
place today. We thank you that there is another in the fire. But I want to focus on, I'll count the joy come every battle, because I know that's where you'll be. story and we know where we're going here in this Lenten season but Lord knowing that you're with us knowing that we have someone to turn to that's what makes this journey be so just worth it so worth all that we've done Lord, we ask that you continue to just bless us, and we ask that you open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears so that we hear what you want us to hear today, and continue to just show us where we need to be in this world, what we need to do in this world. Help us find our part in your great story. It's in your great, powerful, and loving name that we pray. Amen. gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 15 verses 1 through 20. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, you say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release 
a prisoner for them and anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed and spat upon him and knelt down to pay him homage. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his clothes on him. They led him out to crucify him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, my God, my rock and my redeemer, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I grew up in Middlesex County. Every year in the first weekend of November, the town of Urbana was closed down for the Oyster Festival. School is canceled, the buses can't go through the town, the festival has not one, but two parades. <clears throat> On Friday night, there is a fireman's parade. The fire departments from all over bring their shiniest trucks, maybe their oldest ones or maybe their newest ones. And the town is blasted with the sounds of sirens. On Saturday, there's a different parade. One with floats, old cars, decorated golf carts and marching bands and the pageant contestants for the Little Miss Fat contest. Great Bridge, too, loves a parade, doesn't it? I've never seen a place that uh, lines the streets weeks in advance with chairs, and no one messes with it. It's kind of amazing. We just had a little parade of our own as we entered this house of worship, waving palm branches and singing about Hosanna. It's what we do at this Beginning of Holy Week, it's how we set this week apart. It's how it begins. In our scripture this morning, we find ourselves in another parade as Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem. But as Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crosan note, Jesus' parade wasn't the only one that was taking place in the city that day. Every year on Passover, pilgrims would flock from all over to Jerusalem to worship and remember. This was a time for people to get away from their normal routines and be united as a people of faith. For some, this would be a once-in-a-lifetime journey. This Passover celebration was a time when the Jewish people celebrated the ways that their God had delivered and liberated them from the oppressive Egyptian empire long ago. Because the Romans knew what the celebration was celebrating, the Roman governor of Judea would come to Jerusalem to keep the peace and to make sure that the citizens didn't get any big ideas about liberating themselves from any other empire anytime soon. Kristen Adkins Whitesides notes that there wasn't just one parade, but there were two. One entering from the west and one entering from the east. Pilate processed into Jerusalem through the largest gate, 
the Western Gate riding on a war horse with cavalry soldiers, banners, and troops marching behind him. The streets were cleared and large crowds gathered to watch the display. And none of the pilgrims who had gathered to worship in Jerusalem could miss the point being made. Their celebration was only happening at the tolerant pleasure of the Roman government. On the other side of town, another more ragtag procession had begun. Jesus rode into town on the colt of a donkey from the Mount of Olives on the east side of the city, surrounded by a crowd of followers. They spread their cloaks and palm branches ahead of him. They shouted, Hosanna, and the treasonous chant, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Pilate rode a war horse through the largest gate into the city, decked out with armor and banners and waving troops behind him. Jesus rode a donkey colt through a small eastern gate. He wore no armor and was followed by small children waving palm branches instead of banners. There were two parades that day into the city, but they could not have been more different. One was a military display of imperial might, and one was a small protest with a poor band of rebels crying Hosanna, or as it is translated in Hebrew, save us, save us now. You see, Hosanna is no simple cheer. It is a prayer and a plea, a cry of protest, and it paves the way for what will come. For Palm Sunday is a day of contrast, and we are confronted with the choice between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar, between Jesus and Barabbas. We recognize on this day that this contrast is central to the story of Jesus' life and to our understanding of the gospel. As Borg and Crosan note, the confrontation between these two kingdoms continues through the last week of Jesus' life. As we all know, this week will end with Jesus' execution by the powers who ruled this world. Holy Week is the story of confrontation, and Palm Sunday is its beginning. Two processions made their way into Jerusalem that day, and as we move through this week, we will witness the confrontation between God's way and the human way, our way. We witness the way that Jesus becomes a threat to our way. If we continue to follow Jesus in this procession, we will join him in an upper room as he talks about betrayal and denial and the way that love looks like sacrifice and service. And suffering. We will watch as he breaks bread and pours out a cup and tells us that he will be, that they will be reminders for us of his broken body and his shed blood, physical reminders of his suffering love. We will gather with him in a garden and watch as he prays and pleads for his life. We will watch as even his most committed followers cannot sit and pray with him for even one hour. We will watch as he is led away, arrested, and betrayed. If we continue to follow this Jesus in this procession, we will follow him all the way to the trial as he cry, as the cries of Hosanna are drowned out by the shouts of crucify him. If we continue to follow Jesus in this procession, we will follow him all the way to the cross as the crowds who had once gathered to join Jesus in protest now chant for his execution. How do we get from the crowd crying, Hosanna, save us, to a crowd who shouts, crucify him? We end up with this contrast because Jesus did not come to satisfy the crowds. He does not come to align himself with the religious experts, not nor does he come to serve or confront Rome. The people cried, Hosanna. They wanted him to save him. But they didn't understand that how he would save them 
was to take the place of a guilty man on the cross. They didn't understand that Barabbas, which means the son of a father, was all of us. We are all the sons and daughters of a father, while Jesus is the son of the father. In Mark 11, 12, and 14, the religious experts are trying to figure out how to trap Jesus in his words, but they are treading lightly because they don't want to upset the crowds. In Mark 14, they have somehow enraged the crowds, and while Pilate doesn't want to release a guilty rebel, he also wants to keep the peace. Pilate wants to satisfy the crowds. He figures when he offers them Jesus, that people who have been following him are going to ask for his release, and that he won't have to let Barabbas go, and he won't have to do what the religious experts are asking not because Pilate is sympathetic to Jesus, but because he doesn't see Jesus as a threat, and he knew Barabbas was a guilty rebel murderer who would be a problem for Rome. Jews didn't like Romans, and Romans didn't like Jews, and it's possible that Barabbas was respected because he stood up against the Romans. Jesus healed people and cast out demons, ate with sinners and welcomed the poor, but he didn't stand up against the Romans. He stood there silently, and during his ministry, he preached that we should love our enemies. The innocent son of the father takes the place of the guilty son of a father. Palm Sunday is all about the hope of salvation, the desire for freedom, peace, and justice. The crowds didn't know that Jesus' silence would lead to their salvation. Isaiah 53 verses 5 through 7 says, He was pierced because of our rebellions and crushed because of our crimes. He bore the punishment that made us whole. By his wounds we are healed. Like sheep we had all wandered away each going its own way, but the Lord let fall on him all our crimes. He was oppressed and tormented, but he didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb being brought to the slaughter, like a ewe silent before her shearers, he didn't open his mouth. There is a deep temptation for us to go straight from the shouts of Hosanna to the alleluias of resurrection. It would be easy for us to skip past Holy Week and the inner confrontation of ourselves and the story as we acknowledge that in some way or another, we participate in the suffering and death of Jesus. Whether we're the religious people who claim there is only one way to worship God, or we're Peter who denies him, or we're Judas who betrayed him, or we're Pilate who just seeks to satisfy the crowds, We might be all or none of these, but we are all, all the guilty who are set free. Like those first followers of Jesus, we don't always know where the path of discipleship will lead us. So maybe it is easier for us to wave some palm branches and then gather again next Sunday to celebrate the resurrection and skip the rest. Skip the quiet service of Maundy Thursday and the suffering of Good Friday. Skip the choice between the way of Jesus and the way of this world. Maybe it is easier to show up for the parade, but ignore the paradox. Let's not skip it. Let's not skip it. Let's be transformed by God whose power is made perfect, not in might, but in the vulnerable love who comes on the back of a donkey instead of a war horse, and whose greatest victory is found not on a battlefield, but in an empty tomb. Will we once again choose to follow Jesus? Palm and Passion Sunday reminds us that hope and despair travel on this road together. We will despair at the brokenness of our world and of our lives. And we will place our hope in the one who travels alongside us, 
the one who leads us onwards in this strange parade. Hosanna, we cry. Save us, we pray. And then picking up our cloaks and our crosses, we make our way behind Jesus, knowing that he has already traveled this road before us, and know, he knows how to lead this parade as we move from pain to praise, from suffering to salvation, from death to everlasting life. Amen. Let us come before God in the time of prayer. Lord, we gathered in this worship space to offer praise to you. Where we've heard the refrain of Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Save us now. Lord, we want things in an instant. You know that about us. We want things to be our way. We want to be in control. We make many times you to be who you're not meant to be. We fashion you after our desires. It's amazing how oftentimes we grow disappointed with the gods that we have created. But help us, O oh Lord, to look to you and to trust in the way that you have brought forth salvation in and through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh Lord, to place our trust in you and to come humbly before you for the ways that you are at work in the life of your church and our families and the life of each of us. And so, Lord, we are thankful for this week that is before us. It is a holy week for sure because it's on the calendar, yes. But may it be more than just words on a calendar that says it's supposed to be a holy week for us. But we ask, O oh Lord, for a stirring of your Holy Spirit, not just when we've gathered in this place for worship, but may your Holy Spirit lead us. Lead us into moments of deep reflection, quiet meditations, as we ponder the depth of your great love for us. And we understand and come to understand the way that you have brought salvation. Help us, O oh Lord, to place our trust in you, to know that you indeed are with us each step of the way as we journey by faith, as we journey in hope, Guide us, we pray. Lead us from the proclamation of Hosanna to the proclamation of He is risen. But guide us in this week between that we might find new ways of honoring that sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we come before you, we, we look to you as a great physician. Where there's brokenness and disease, we pray for your healing. Lord, we pray for those who mourn this day. We pray especially for the community of Great Bridge Middle School and for all who mourn the loss of their assistant principal, John Wecht. Be a source of peace and a guiding light for the Wecht family and all of those who knew him. Walk gently with those who grieve this week. Lord, we're, we do pray for the people in our commonwealth, for those who have been af impacted by the fires of this week. We're thankful, O oh Lord, for those who, who step up and seek to help. We pray for first responders, uh, for EMTs, for those who are working in fire departments and the police, office, police departments, and we're thankful for their willingness to serve and to protect. Lord, we do pray, O oh Lord, your blessings upon your church as we move forward in faith, as we seek to be the church you're calling us to be, to be a church where we desire that no one misses out on your good grace. So come, Holy Spirit, come and continue to lead us as we journey this week. We offer this in the blessed name of Jesus who taught us the phrase saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
here at this service, we don't pass the baskets around, but we do have a basket at the back of the sanctuary and over here to the right. If you'd like to make an offering uh, to God, we certainly are free to do that as we seek to glorify God, not only with songs of praise, but in the way that we live out our life and the way that we offer our gifts, that God might use those gifts to that we might bring glory to God, but also that those gifts might be used to strengthen our witness as we seek to share Christ when we gather and especially as we scatter.
Let us go into this holy week knowing that we don't walk alone, even as we head towards suffering and death with Jesus, we believe that there is a hope and we can't wait to worship with you throughout this week and again next Sunday. Go in peace to love and serve our God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>